everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming to the Disruptive Mobile Business Panel. Um, we have a pretty exciting panel today with Ime Archibong moderating. Please give him a quick welcome as he comes in and I'll start introducing some other guests. And then, so for the panel we have Ian Rogers, CEO of Beats Music. We have, give it up, you can give it up, yeah. We have, we have Brian Grassadonia, head of Square Cash. Yeah, there you go. Um, Tim Kindle, head of products at Pinterest. There you go. Um, we have Steve Cheney, EVP of Business and Operation at Estimo. Yeah. And then Brian Kirkbride, Head of Partnerships at Nike um, Accelerator and founder of Nike Plus Fuel Labs. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. So you guys thought you were coming here to see a disruptive mobile business panel, but actually we're introducing our new boy band <laughs> coming out today. <laughs> what was the name of it? Mike Check. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, thank you guys for joining us. It's a, it's a thrill to see so many people in the audience for what I think is going to be an amazing panel. Jackie did an amazing job of introducing the folks that are here. Uh, I'm proud to call many of these folks close partners to Facebook and really excited you guys are supporting F8. To kick it off, I'm going to start with a little rapid fire question. We'll start here with Brian and we'll go down to Steve. But what is your favorite mobile app right now? Yeah, so my favorite mobile app, uh, when I think about this, I sometimes really go back to kind of the foundational utilities. So, when I think about when I leave my phone at home, like what happens in my life, right? And if I don't have calendar messages and, uh, and maps, like you don't know what you're supposed to do, you don't know where you're supposed to go, you don't know how to get there, and your life is basically paused, yeah. right? Um, if I were to go kind of more, more uh, to like a new, app, new apps that are coming out recently, like I love Duolingo. Uh, Duolingo is an amazing application, uh, helps you learn new languages. They've kind of, they had a release last week where they're now actually gamifying it so you can find people all around the world and uh, you can kind of compete with them on different levels for learning. So I'm, I'm trying to learn Italian right now. I'm on level, level zero, so don't, 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 ask me, <laughs> don't ask me to say anything yet, but, uh, but, but love that app. Bellissima. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm from Nike, so probably a little biased, right? But I think a lot of the folks who are helping people be more, be more active, you know, move, live a healthier life, I mean, I think it's inherently mobile, right? We want people to get up and move around and run around. And so I think of some of the partners that we're working with uh, in the Fuel Lab, folks like Runkeeper and Strava and MyFitnessPal, and I think that they're doing amazing things to help people, uh, to help people do that. I actually spent a little time with Steve a couple uh, weeks ago, and I think what they're doing at Estimo uh, in terms of, of beacons and the services around that is, is, is awesome. And when we look at kind of blending that physical and digital world of, of being active, I think that's, I think that's a, a really cool experience right now. Yeah, well, at, at Pinterest, we spend a ton of time thinking about discovery. Um, and one of our points of view is that you know, people increasingly are not going to want to enter text on their mobile devices. So we're always looking for ways that companies are taking unique inputs like a unique query to give an output. And there's this company called CamFind. Mm. Uh, you can take a picture of any object, and then they use a combination of machine learning and mechanical Turk to spit back sort of a, a, a representation of that object with a hard link to you know, where you can buy it or you know, Wikipedia information about that, that object. So someone's looking at it? Yeah. Yes. Well, someone, they're either recognizing it through machine learning, which I think is a, is a minority of the, of the of the time when they when they process the object, most of the time it's it, they send it to Mechanical Turk and then they return results. It seems like they could do like my million dollar or no like fifty dollar app idea, which was uh, Shazam for movie stars. You see a B actor in LA, you're like, who yeah. the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take a photo and have some yes. you know have you Mechanical. Start that. Turk. You should start. No, Big no, idea. Use this for it. Big idea. All right. Yeah. <laughs> What else uh, are you using, Ian? Well, I was going to mention Tractor DJ. I don't know if anybody's played with the new Tractor DJ app, but I mean, on the iPad especially. And if you have kids, I have a seven-year-old, you have to give them this. It's incredible to watch them just make mixes. I mean, what you can do now mm -hmm. with, on, on, you know, it's kind of prosumer, right? But really, it's pretty consumer. You don't have to be a musician to have fun with your favorite music. And I think the Tractor DJ thing is just mind-blowing if you haven't played with it. Awesome. Steve? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Whoa. Um, has anyone here used Uber? <laughs> um, um, that was kind Uber? of a serious question, but um, <laughs> the amazing thing is Uber didn't exist like three years ago, right? Two, three years ago. Um, so 
I'm fascinated with the, the concept of like reducing friction for the user. So the user should be doing something they've always done and just eliminate all friction. So there's, there's some apps now that we're experimenting with that um, are like walk into a restaurant and just leave without paying type app. So think about if OpenTable integrated the host knew you were there and you just leave. So there's an app called CoverPay, um, which I think is like kind of that next OpenTable. Um, so things like that. Um, it's called Cover is the specific app. Yeah. Awesome. So what, what's clearly evident is that you guys are all playing in different industries right now, and all these industries are being disrupted by mobile. I'm really curious, for folks that don't necessarily understand or have as intimate an understanding of your guys' industry as you guys do, where those opportunities and challenges are for disruption and those that are definitely being led by mobile. I'll open it up to anyone to start. I mean, I think there's a huge you know, opportunity for disruption just in terms of interaction design. I mean, I think as we move from desktop web to this very small, relatively speaking, form factor, just interaction design, both in terms of what is the designer coming up with in terms of how to swipe and how to discover and how to move into various windows of the app, but also in collaboration with the app engineer in terms of enabling you know, the various kind of velocities of swipes um, that basically make it clear to the user how they, how they use the app. Yeah. So a lot of what we do at Pinterest is we're very, very tightly collaborating between the interaction designers, the front-end engineer, and actually, in a lot of cases, the algorithmic engineers uh, in, in unison, because we think that, that that has to be tightly linked to drive the most sort of compelling and clear user experience. Yeah. I, don't know, I, think, I think when you, uh, when you think about disruption, I think too oftentimes people are thinking about kind of solving problems and not necessarily about, about invention. So that's kind of this thematically. Um, you know, at Square, as we think about this stuff, we're really thinking about building kind of what, what the world could be rather than trying to identify problems um, that we're necessarily seeing in our space. Because it's actually a lot easier for us in our daily lives to kind of see where our pain points are, figure out what problems we want to solve. But everybody's doing that, right? So sometimes the opportunity to deliver value is, is a lot smaller down there. Whereas if you kind of take a neutral experience and create something that's truly amazing, um, there's more white space there. So, um, you know, if you look, at, you look at things like, you know, the iPhone, if somebody would have asked you, Back in 2006, what problems could you solve with a phone? Um, you know, they would have told you that they wanted, uh, you know, better cell reception, smaller, it could fit in your pocket. Um, but what they built was, you know, a mobile device that carried all of your songs, the most best mobile web browsing experience on the market, um, and that was that was a true invention. So I think when we talk about disruption, I really like to think about about invention rather than problem solving. Um, and specifically, kind of in commerce, I think we're seeing um, in payments, we're kind of seeing it come full circle. If you would have gone back. To you know the 1960s, uh, commerce was actually very personal, yeah. and you know you'd go to your butcher shop, uh, you'd you know ask for a slab of meat, and you'd open a tab, right? You'd, you'd put put it on your name, and you'd leave, and you'd come back and settle up a month later. But it wasn't really scalable as as the space started to grow. Um, you know, the payment mechanics had to start getting in our way because of trust issues, right? Credit cards had to be invented. Um, and you know, paper checks had to be invented. So I think we're kind of seeing with technology and with mobile and with the ability to have more contextual awareness, we're actually seeing kind of commerce and payments come back full circle where the, the technology is actually disappearing, right? I can now go into a coffee shop and just pay with my name, and even though the payment is happening, um, you know, the technology is not getting in our way. Um, and I think that you know, with Square Cash, what I work on, um, you know, we tried to kind of do the same thing. We're using just email as a messaging platform and a form of communication for sending money. So trying to, trying to bring the technology and take the technology away so that we're able to, able to focus more on the experience. Yeah, I think, you know, in our space, it's, it really kind of picks up on that, on that trail, right? We're seeing, you know, as we kind of in our, and the folks in our space really try to help people be more active, you're seeing a ton of innovation and a ton of disruption on kind of uh, the ubiquity of sensing. Right, and kind of that disappearing and, and really moving away from just the ability to track and tell you what you're doing, but really kind of the freedom of that data to the developer community, to, uh, to the consumer, and really forcing uh, the companies in our space to kind of deliver on the promise of that, right? So, you know, really forcing us to go to um, how do we deliver more immersive experiences for people? How do we deliver um, more customized uh, experiences for people? And ultimately, with all of that information there, uh, we're going to know what's working, right? And so it really kind of is this, is this super interesting kind of period of transition in our space where you have this ubiquity of sensing and this freedom of data, and it really is now kind of time for, for folks in our industry to deliver on the promise uh, of that potential. And I think the other super interesting part of that in our space is, is kind of this idea of, hey, look, people are obviously inherently active in the real world. And so you know, these technologies like Estimote and others that are really effective at kind of blending 
um, that experience, really providing a more holistic kind of immersive experience, uh, both obviously around the event or around the physical world, but bringing your, you know, your social network with you, bringing your, your digital experience with you. We, uh, the Nike women's half marathon was actually in DC this past weekend. And honestly, you can't differentiate between kind of the physical event and kind of the fact that it's being tracked with a run and, and you're sharing that experience with your friends and that dad actually comes into the race with you and it goes to the store if you go to Nike Town with you. And I just think that, that element we're seeing, I think 10 million impressions of Nike Plus runs per day on Facebook. Incredible. And it's just, it is just a core element of the running experience for our runners and for their friends. And I think those things where you really see that, that kind of genuine blending uh, is, is just super powerful in our space. What about music? I think well, in, in the media world, generally, the disruption has come with just sort of the unlocking of, of all of the media. You know, when, when we all grew up, it was, you know, we, are, we had these limited distribution channels of television and FM radio and whatnot. And, you know, a long time ago, the internet unlocked all of those. And, um, you know, the industries didn't react quickly, as we know. I mean, that's, that's the, the history. I think the, the challenges that, that we see are, you know, you, you can never go against what the consumers want. Um, you know, the, the, the consumers will always ultimately disrupt you. Right. Uh, media has definitely seen that. You know, consumers want, you know, they want their media digitally. And that was, you know, industries were in denial about that 10 years ago. They aren't now. But the challenge is, is now everything is available for free in some way, shape, or form. And how do you add value on, on top of that? Yeah. You know, so we're a four-pay subscription service, and, and we try to bring you, you know, curated and personalized experience that's on top of something that, admittedly, you, you could get for free and you have been able to get for free since Napster, right? right? So you know, it's about trying to find the ways that you can really provide value and build something that's worth paying for um, that, that is really in service of, uh, of the user, you know, because the, the, whole, you know, the, the whole media space has been disrupted um, so fundamentally that I, I think that you know a lot, what a lot of us are trying to do is to try to figure out, okay, what's what's the best way that we can add value? Because right. there's yeah. you know only these two people that matter: the people who love music, the people who make music. So how do you add value in between? That's fair. What about you, Steve? You guys yeah, are yeah. creating some interesting technology and interesting space. Yeah, yeah. So there's this use um, con this word context that's used a ton, right? And it's repeated in different <laughs> different contexts. Um, and I think like we take for granted now the social context and the fabric and connectivity of a service like Facebook that didn't exist 10 years ago, right? Um, and there's these other sort of verticalized services now that are emerging to connect us, to connect us with things that we do and people that we like. Um, so Estimote, right, what Estimote is, it's actually a little bit different than consumer companies. It's also a little bit different in that there's software and hardware. This is a device that you would throw in this venue, and this venue would contextually understand that you're here. So if you weren't in this room and you wanted to favorite on the Parse app, to come to this grow panel, then your app could potentially know that you weren't in the room and it could say, hey, you're, you, know, you need to go over to the panel, it's starting in five minutes, right? So I think like when you think about um, building a platform of context, it includes what you're doing with people's places and things in your, in your physical environment, right? But if you don't unlock that for users and you don't give that to app developers at the platform level, there's really little they can do um, kind of with that. So we're, like, we're obsessed with just making the physical world actually smarter. And if you just close your eyes for like a second, you become, it, everything changes for you, right? If you just literally close your eyes for a second, you can no longer see the sign in front of you. You no longer know that that wall is about 150 feet away. And that's actually what your smartphone is. It's completely dumb from context. It's connected to the wide area network, and it knows that it's connected to the world, and you can access information from the cloud. But it actually can't see it's blind. Um, so I think there's a location context that people have been talking about for a while, but it's going to change, and a lot of services are going to change over the next five to 10 years to unlock that. That's awesome. Great deep dive into estimate too, what you guys are doing. Curious, Square Cash, talk to us a little bit more about what you guys are doing to disrupt the commerce space, in particular with your product. Sure. So, um, so for those who aren't familiar, uh, Square Cash is the easiest and fastest way of sending or requesting money from, from, from anybody. Um, and kind of the, the stance that we took was that the concept of a stored value account, um, like a secondary holding account, really broke a lot of what, 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 what that was actually what was, what's been wrong a lot uh, with peer-to-peer -peer payments historically. Um, when I'm going to send money to somebody, I don't want to have to think about if I'm using a service that 
the person's already using on the other end. So Square Cash doesn't require an account. It doesn't require a login. All you have to do is enter your debit card information to put the money directly into your bank account. So you know, I don't have to think about if the person on the other end is using Square Cash. I don't have to think about if the person on the other end if they're happy to receive the money to the place that I'm about to send it to, because it's not going to go to some place that they can't use it. Is it's anyone not happy to receive money? <laughs> <laughs> some people, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, so the money goes directly into people's bank accounts, and um, and that's really the foundation of the product. It's in in many instances, it's in, or many cases, it's instant. Uh, so the money will show up in your account within three seconds, uh, directly into your bank account. And we're really trying to reduce all the anxiety on the part of the sender, so you don't have to think about anything. You just know if I owe somebody money, I'm going to use Square Cash and I'm going to send it to them. And it's going to work. Yeah. It's going to work, and they'll be happy to receive it that way. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, on Nike. Yeah, you know, um, so we sell athletic footwear and apparel. No, so um, on the digital side of Nike, uh, obviously, uh, you know, Nike was founded by Coach Bowerman, who was uh, the track and field coach at the University of Oregon, and he started tinkering with. Um, shoes, not because he wanted to, you know, build an athletic footwear empire, but because he wanted to help his athletes perform better. And so that kind of notion has always been kind of instilled at Nike, right? Our mission statement is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete on the planet. And we think if you have a body, you're an athlete. And so what we want to do on the digital side is kind of bring that, you know, uh, coaching, that, that full vision of holistic coaching to every athlete and help them improve in whatever context that that may mean uh, for them. And I talked a little bit about um, some of the disruptions that have happened in that space in terms of ubiquitous sensing and kind of the and availability of data leading to more personalized and immersive services. And I think, you know, when we look at that landscape, what that means to us is, you know, uh, you should see all of these kind of services become more personalized, become uh, deeper. And we think that Nike Fuel, which is a metric, uh, we, which we think is the best metric to measure movement or activity, and I won't step everyone through the science, but um, we think that in that environment where there's all this ocean of, you know, this vast ocean of things for you to do, ways for you to be active, that an ability to provide kind of connective tissue that it provides a common language for all of those activities will allow consumers and will allow um, uh, developers to kind of uh, provide a longitudinal uh, understanding, right, of my movement. So across time, am I getting better? You know, how is that journey going for me? And it also enables kind of cross-activity comparisons and, and insights. And so we think that enables kind of you know, a deeper set of knowledge and the ability to understand how you're improving, to have a discussion, to have a communication with your friends, and for the folks who are interested in it to um, set goals and, and, and do challenges. And so you know, we think there's this really powerful ability that Nike has to motivate people. We think that we have years and years of obviously working with great athletes to help them get better. We want to try to bring that to the, to the main market. But I think the big thing the key for us in, in order to deliver on that vision is really to um, kind of distill down to our unique points of value, right? And that's often really hard for a company that's kind of bigger or is coming at it from, from maybe didn't grow up, obviously, uh, intuitively in, in the technology side. And so I think when we look at what do we have to do to be successful in that environment, uh, part of it is, is really kind of focusing in, and, and figuring out how we deliver that value. And so we certainly need to make sure that Nike Fuel is available and accessible across an array of devices so people can earn Nike Fuel when they're trying to be active. We need to make sure it's integrated into the services that people love. Some of those hopefully will be Nike. The vast majority will not. Uh, we need to make sure that we add depth and dimension around Nike Fuel and the related services. And we need to develop world-class developer tools and services and, and support. And we're super committed and super excited about kind of being right at the precipice of, of that point for us. I talked a little bit about the Fuel Lab uh, at the start, but we're kind of working with with you know, a handful of partners now, uh, super excited about how those integrations are going, and really excited about kind of the next, the next phase of that where we get, uh, we get even a little bit more open. So that's kind of what we're working on. I just want to point out that Brian's fuel band was beaming, go Brian, as you were talking, so. Yeah, it's, it's reminding <laughs> me that this may not be the most active setting for me. Uh, yeah. I, I thought it was cheering you on. Exactly. I thought it was really liking exactly. what you were saying yeah, about fuel bands. Thumbs up. <laughs> Awesome. Ian, why don't we stay with you, actually? Go up. How, how is Beats adding unique value to the music space right now? How you guys are disrupting things? Well, well Beats was founded by Jimmy Iovine and, and Dr. Dre and 
you know, Luke Wood, who runs Beats Electronics. Um, and then we brought in Trent Reznor as a, on the chief creative officer side. Um, and with the, with the goal to do something that, this, that existing music services weren't doing, and as I was mentioning earlier, being in service or of service to, to music consumers, um, you know, our, our feeling is that where other services might have answered this question of like, what comes after digital downloads in terms of format, right? Like, after vinyl, there was cassette, and then CD, and then digital downloads, and now we do all have mobile devices. So over the air, we're not going to connect our phone with a little white cable and get our music, right? It is going to come over the air to our, um, to our phones. But nobody was really answering the question of what should I listen to? What comes after FM radio? What is, we are going to pick up our phones and tune into something. And it's not going to be 105.9 or 92.3. It's going to be, you know, something. Culturally, yeah. what is that? So we, our approach has been to build something that's curated um, and curated by human beings and then personalized. So our, you know, our belief is that just, you know, the, the next phase of web distribution generally is curation by trusted sources. Mm -hmm. So we try to provide that curation, but then we try to match that curation to your tastes. So. Tim, what about Pinterest? You guys are in a unique space, but you're doing some awesome things. Yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, there's some similar things to what Ian was getting at sort of thematically, which is that we, we basically think that um, we, we essentially want to do for discovery what Google did for search. Um, and we think fundamentally, if you look at just discovery in a generalizable sense, it's just not done well right. online. Um, and so we've just been working for a long time to sort of build a service <coughs> where lots of people can collect the things that they love and then go out and do those things. And we're at an interesting time now where we've built out now tens of millions of users connected to over 30 billion pins. Mm -hmm. And what that actually provides is a very interesting corpus upon which we can now start to build very interesting discovery uh, services and discovery products. Um, so we just launched a product last week called Guided Search. Yeah. Um, and it really is in the vein of discovery. It's in the vein of, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but I, maybe I'll go running. And I select running as my initial query, and then we present a carousel, a visual carousel below that that says <coughs> trails, shoes, um, socks. So there are all these different sort of paths that I can go down. And the idea is that you can telescope down those paths and then you can telescope back out. And you don't need to be nearly as directed in terms of what you're looking for in the way that you are with, with standard search. Yeah. Um, so increasingly, we're just going to be on top of that really rich corpus, which now is, is approaching a level of comprehensiveness. Right. We now think we're ready to start building out a lot of interesting discovery experiences that we and think will be. And it's all human curated, right? And it's all human curated. I mean, that's, that's the interesting thing about the corpus that's distinct from the corpus that a web crawler yeah. results in. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all those. All those links are generated by you know, a human being saying, I like that running trail, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on the board that says favorite running trails in California. And then we can use all of that information to then make the next person's discovery experience even better who's looking for running trails in California. Awesome. And a, lo a lot of apps right now are using VLE to do discovery, right, in like a very organic way. I'm curious, do you have, like, have you seen anything that's interesting that's catching your attention that you think is going to be disruptive in any space that's being built up atop of uh, BLE technology? Yeah, there are. I mean, so when iBeacon came out, right, um, it, was, it was nothing. No one knew what to do with it. And so there was this wave that was created by Apple. And, and we're basically trying to help people surf the wave, right? Mm -hmm. Like, So it, in effect, we're a developer-facing platform for people that are just getting into the dirty with their code. And we just try to make it super neat for them, super easy to develop. So we're like the Twilio for iBeacon or Stripe for iBeacon. If you're going to put text messaging in your app, use Twilio. Why? Because it's the best and because it works and because your developer friends told you it's the best, right? So that's the mission. That's the charter. And I think it's actually a lot easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And unlocking those tools for de developers is extremely challenging. So when we talk to like big brand, not some innovative like Nike that can just, like just kind of do it and go from concept to store like pretty easily because they're an incredible thinker and thought leader in digital. But imagine the sort of layman, right, that wants to, wants to do something. And the challenge is to, to help them to make money, to help them to do things that they couldn't have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. And at, at our core, we need people to make money, right? So we make money if, if they do. Um, something interesting we saw the other day, we were talking to a big um, insurance company. So we, what we do goes beyond retail. And this insurance company was saying, like, when they match people that are in network to in network doctors, then the matching process 
happens and it's to everyone's benefit and so on and so forth. And if you've got a network, you know, maybe advantage is for you, but kind of insurance system breaks down. So training someone to have an app when they go in the hospital, probably high friction, probably not going to happen tomorrow morning, right? But what if you had the app on your phone and when you walk into the hospital, there's 40 places that you could go and only 20 of them are in network, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what they want to build. They just want to build this matchmaking app that says you should go to this doctor now that you're physically here. Mm -hmm. So I think like, I think the manifestation of what we're trying to do is just enable people to do things they couldn't do. And if it's an app that didn't exist before and they're doing something innovative and disruptive, like it's the person that's going to disrupt OpenTable, then, and they're using our platform, and they make money, then they, in effect, become the killer app, right? Mm -hmm. They become the killer app just like Lotus123 was on <laughs> Windows. Um, and these things that we just laugh at now because they're so long ago, but every platform kind of had one. Um, I think for Twilio, GroupMe was the killer app. Um, GroupMe just started sending a gazillion messages overnight. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what we think about obsessively. And I think like having that charter and that mission is just something that kind of keeps us like pretty agnostic to the way that it's, the value is delivered to the consumer and which, which other like meta platforms we partner up with. Yeah. What's, the, what's the doctor use case? Like I, I, go to, I go to one doctor who's in network at a hospital and then I find out there are other doctors that I could go see that day. Yeah, so I mean, may, imagine maybe like to dumb it down even, or like you were, you know, you were looking for points on ZocDoc and if ZocDoc had integrated Estimode and there was a, there was a, there was a beacon in the uh, doctor's office, then in theory then it would tell you something contextually about which doctor to go when it, when it was probably more effective or cheaper, or you could get a more better appointment. This specific thing was keeping a patient in network, because if you, you can, so I got uh, tore my ACL a while back, and I went to a hospital, I live in New York, went to the Upper East Side, got to the hospital, everything was in network, except the doctor wasn't, there was renting space in this hospital for special surgery. <laughs> so my MRI, instead of it being like $100, was like $2,000. Mm. So the app would have, in theory, prevented me from doing that got correctly. It. Makes sense. You said money a lot. This is a monetization track. So I'm curious. I mean, you guys are all incredible products. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for the way you think about product. But there's often this tension between building a great disruptive product and also making money. Anyone want to talk about how you reconcile the two? I mean, I think in Pinterest's case, you don't, <laughs> uh, which, which is why I joined the company to begin with. I mean, I think it's, I think it's the most interesting business to be built since AdWords mm -hmm. because the alignment is so, is so perfect. Yeah. Um, you're, not, you know, you're not browsing, you know, in the offline world, I'm not browsing a, a photo album of my friends. I'm actually effectively browsing a catalog or, or browsing a magazine in an interest area. Yeah. And fundamentally, if you're going to be in the ad business, that's, that's like the perfect experience um, that, a, that an ad model dovetails with really well. Makes a lot of sense. And I think generally the, the nice thing about the, the service as well is that you think about a traditional social service where when I friend someone, that might add value for me as a user. It doesn't actually make it easier for advertisers to target ads. Mm -hmm. in, in the Pinterest case, every time we create a link between a user and something they interact with, which is a pin, mm -hmm. it's an interest. It creates utility for them, it creates utility for other users, and it adds value for advertisers. Mm -hmm. I think in, in Nike's case, and I kind of touched on this a little bit before, but right, we, we certainly have our, our kind of core business. I think what we, the tension maybe that we feel is, is what I touched on in terms of how can we maximize our contribution to the ecosystem, to our partners, and, and ultimately to consumers. And, and I think uh, you know, that can be, again, a challenge, I think, for, for larger companies where we have this you know, desire, frankly, to, to put out great experience is kind of across the landscape. But I think that can be you know, certainly challenging. It can be confusing to partners uh, and confusing to consumers. And so I think what we're really, the tension we almost feel is kind of, you know, how do we, again, how do we kind of distill down to our maximum value? We're really great at putting, and I, I have nothing to do with it, so I'll brag, uh, brag about it all day long, at putting together just incredibly uh, uh, emotional events and inspirational events and communicating that journey through huge inspirational moments like the World Cup or the Olympics. And, that's a huge value that we can bring to partners in our space who are creating incredible services, mm. but don't have the benefit of that kind of core existing business model, right? So, so yes, 
you know, a lot of work to do in terms of great developer services and adding depth and dimension to fuel and kind of focusing in on those things. But we do have this ability to reach hundreds of millions of people on a daily basis. And we need to figure out how our partners can leverage from that. We do have the ability to, to kind of add a commerce element, an elegant kind of commerce integration, which can be really powerful for people as they're trying to kind of discover their business model. Um, and so I think for us, it's, it's really that. I think that's the, the tension we feel is, is how do we make sure that we're really focusing on delivering the, the maximum value in distinct points so that the ecosystem can be uh, can thrive? You know, what are the utilities we need to create? What are the other services that we need to create to really maximally benefit both athletes and, and consumers? So it's a little bit of a different yeah. tension, I think, for us. I think the, the value point is great because, I mean, if you're in a business like, like, like AdWords where there is like that direct alignment, that's awesome. If you're not, I think oftentimes just focusing on creating the maximum amount of value that, you, value that you possibly can and not getting distracted with solving problems on the margin or solving you know, problems that might be addictive and, and addictive problems are actually uh, sometimes, or addictive products can sometimes be uh, you know, misunderstood as actually adding a lot of value. Yeah, but yeah. Adding, building products that maximize value, in some respect, the business side is going to take care of itself. It's almost a tactic. If you, if you spend your time maximizing that, there's a ton of value there and you can, you can figure out how to monetize it tactically. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Any thoughts? I mean, from yeah. our perspective, like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to just build a music product that, that is worth paying for. And our monetization strategy is really straightforward. We have a trial, and then at the end of the trial, there's a, a monthly subscription fee um, for the service. So for us, you know, it, it is about being above the bar and being worth paying for. Mm -hmm. and, and really being willing to look a consumer in the eye and say, you know, we, music is a big part of your life. The moment you wake up to, you go running, you go to work, you're listening at your desk, you're listening in your car, you're listening when you're making dinner, after dinner. And, you know, the, and so for all the music in the world, um, $100 a month, roughly, is, is, is a, actually a tremendous bargain. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and contributing to a functional you know, music ecosystem will have you know, a long-term a long payout, so artists can, uh, can continue to do what they do, et cetera. Um, so I think you know, for us, it's that, it's that combination of really just serving those people who matter in, in, in the music value chain, the people who make music and the people who love music, mm -hmm. and you know, somewhat uh, unapologetically saying, this is worth paying for, and knowing that there's an audience of people who will do that. I mean, you've got 25 million plus paying for Sirius Satellite Radio. You've got 30 million plus playing for Netflix. You have, a, uh, you have you know, 100 million people in, in, the, in the U.S paying for cable or satellite radio at, you know, a, a, a rate that is 10x yeah. what our service costs. And I think that as, you know, your cable bill comes unbundled, um, I think, you know, I look at, at my 23-year-old daughter who will never have cable, right? She will, um, she'll have a, a Beats subscription and a Hulu subscription and a, um, you know, an HBO and ESPN if she could, yeah. you know, and, and that $40 bundle or $50 bundle is going to provide way more value to her personally mm -hmm. than that $100 bundle does today. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I think similar to what Tim said, right? So um, we're like kind of, you know, a version of a Pinterest many years ago. Um, there's a reason why you lose money initially as a startup is because you have venture capitalists, right? So you go to venture capitalists and you say, we want to create a big business. Give me $20 million so I can do it. So we're in that phase, um, kind of the, the very early beginnings of it, right? And I think for us, it's all about leverage and it's accelerating people's adoption of this new technology. Like, if it doesn't work, like, we're not going to make money. If it works, estimates likely to do well. So we think about, like, the concept of agile development at the platform level. And the way that works is, like, you see some killer use case, you try to go find it, and you power it, and then you enable the, you know, the, the, this friction between monetization and how you're doing to, like, kind of go away. And I think in the full stack startup analog, like, there's this concept of, like, disruptions used to be toys. And I think it's a little bit different now. Like, if you saw Uber the first day you ever used it, you knew right away it was disruptive. The problem was is that in order to do that full stack approach, instead of going to taxis and saying, we're going to go to taxis and partner with them, they're like, screw it, we're going to do everything ourselves. And I'm going to be like Travis, and I'm going to go drive the car. So if you were using Uber the first time, you're the first person that ever used it, and no one else could use it. So by nature, they launched probably in one city, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the next disruptive mobile businesses will just be like somewhere you've never seen before. They'll be on an island. They'll be out in China. They'll be in your backyard, and you won't know because you didn't, you didn't use it or know about it. Um, and so for 
our, our approach to the building like a location platform for the mobile internet is to just basically be everywhere and to try to power our unfair share of those experiences. And if they do well, there'll be a killer app on top and, and we'll make lots of money. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So we have another track called Hacker Our Way, and it's essentially Facebook, Instagram, Parse employees talking about the culture we use to building product and designing product. And you just mentioned that you guys are just at the start, right? YC graduates from two years ago, a year ago? Just this last summer. Just actually. this last summer. And then we have companies that have been around for 50, 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> yeah. So your guys' approach to disruption and innovation are probably very different. I'm curious, culturally, inside your companies, how that plays out. And, the teams you guys are putting together, uh, areas that you're hiring people from. How do you guys think about this stuff? And I'd love to hear from everyone on this because I know we're all a big, wide range of companies. Yeah. Well, with, with Square Cash, we actually kind of took a philosophy of, of trying to model a, a startup within a startup. I'm not sure how cliche that is or not. But, but um, you know, I think the most important thing is that you're kind of aligning, aligning accountability with decision making um, and making sure that you're structuring the team and have an environment where you avoid decision paralysis at all costs. Because that's, that's oftentimes the thing that can really kill you is if you have great ideas, but because of your organizational structure and you need to get approval from you know, somebody on compliance and that person has a different boss than somebody else and it can, can actually really slow you down. Mm -hmm. So um, with Square Cash specifically, we really took, took kind of embraced the full stack model, um, aligned the decision making uh, for the product with the accountability for the product mm -hmm. and uh, just put, put processes in place to make decisions very, very, as, as soon, uh, very, very quickly um, and then kind of re revisiting them if, it, if we found out they were the wrong ones, but not letting this big, long list of outstanding decisions kind of paralyze you. Yeah. Okay. A brand company, how do you do technology? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in a way, um, you know, it's really fortunate to be at Nike, right? Because I think innovation is just the DNA of the company. I mean, it's kind of how we've grown the business in footwear and apparel, and it's, it really is just kind of true to Nike. At the same time, moving into new areas obviously is, is, is a big challenge and just having a larger company obviously creates, uh, just creates inertia, right? There's a lot of, there's just a lot more people to bring together, more committees to go through, all of that stuff and, uh, and we'll spare the committee jokes, but you know, <laughs> true, right? So um, I think, uh, I think that at Nike, we do a, a really good job of making sure that it's a top-down approach. I mean, there's nothing more important. I think when I joined the company, Mark Parker, our CEO, said uh, <coughs> innovation had a quote kind of at a conference the day before that was innovation and collaboration are really our paths forward. And so for us, we have the benefit of just a top-down approach of this is who we are, this is critical to our, to our growth forward. Um, but that does take, uh, it does take leaders. You know, Steph, Stefan Olander, who, who started Digital Sport, is has, has really paved the way over the last seven or eight years at Nike of kind of bringing people into the space and, and frankly creating with Nike Plus uh, eight years ago now, some of the tracking movement. I think we feel like with, with the fuel, brand, fuel band, we really brought that into kind of uh, on your wrist and kind of a form factor that people would like. And I think it takes, it takes that courage and leadership at a big company to really kind of um, to drive that change. But then I think there's, you know, there's also a nice ability for us to um, to really develop smaller working groups that kind of can mimic uh, some of the dynamics you find in, in earlier stage companies, right? I think it's Steve Blake that has some really good uh, stuff out there about big companies are basically execution engines and, and startup companies are, are much more dynamic and kind of searching for a business model. And once you find that, you begin that transition. And I think we have to, um, you know, we take a lot of effort to kind of put structures in place where, you know, that's encouraged and where we have the ability to kind of experiment like that. But it, it definitely is hard. And then, you know, frankly, we, we try to work with as many as we can, right? We did an accelerator program a year ago mm -hmm. uh, where we just spent 90 days working, you know, side by side with folks who were just trying to figure it out. And that stuff, you know, there's some, some aspect of it that, like, you just have to do it, right. right? You just have to get out there and start working that way in order for it to kind of slowly kind of creep across the organization. Too cheesy to say just do it? No, I said yeah, we have to I say it. It's been said. It's been said. <laughs> Tim, There's explosive uh, growth right now, right? Yeah, yeah, great growth, and and I, I think, like I said, we're just trying to build as quickly as possible lots of amazing discovery experiences. I, I'd say in terms of how we work, what we launched last week is a great example. Um, we basically two months ago, that product went from original prototype to launch to the public in 60 days, mm -hmm. and the original prototype was. Uh, a machine learning engineer, a guy who worked at Google and was, was one of the original guys who built Caffeine. Yeah. Um, 
a really talented iOS engineer and then a very talented interaction designer who was the lead designer at Lightroom and before that uh, designed Apple.com. Um, those guys got together, they built a prototype, it felt good. Mm -hmm. um, the actual interaction in front end was done 30 days before launch and actually the algorithm that guys were catching up and trying to make sure that like it just it just felt right and the images matched the terms that we were showing in the carousel. But um, interesting in that the project wasn't even on the roadmap when we planned Q1 mm -hmm. back in December. And then these guys kind of came up with this idea in February. Three of them got together, the team then grew to eight to, to bring it to production and then we launched it last week. So I think we're just gonna keep, that model seems to be working. It's a little bit a little bit rogue, but it really fires up engineers and developers. And so the, the longer we can keep that going, I think yeah. I think we'll just get goodness out of it. That's awesome. Ian, you're, a, you're an industry industry veteran, but now you're playing and disrupting that space. How do you think about your team, your culture, like what you're building at Beatsport? Well, I mean, relative to what we're building on the mobile side, you know, we, our goal is to be everywhere that, that you might want to listen to music. So that's mm -hmm. going to be on your phone or it's in your web browser or it might be, you know, in your home through something like Sonos or, you know, car companies have head units. Um, and, you know, there's, so we, we launched with iOS, Android, uh, Windows Mobile, we, you know, we added, um, we, we made it public our API right away. Um, we have a web client. We have so th the way we're actually organized is around each of those pieces. So it's a hub and spoke, mo spoke model. We have um, a core team that's developing those APIs, yeah. um, and then we have each of those client teams, you know, really a around them, on, you know, trying to stay together in terms of releasing features at the same time. But they're also uh, you know, they're all on their own, own roadmaps and trying to be really native to each of those platforms, right? Mm -hmm. We're not, our, our Android app looks like Android and our iOS app looks like, um, looks like iOS and, you know, we have an iPad app coming that fits that form factor. So you, there are, you know, to really be successful on each of these platforms, mm -hmm. you want to develop specifically for them. Yeah. So we, you know, that's, that's the way that we're organized and the way that we execute, but I also keep uh, a team whose job is to never work on anything that's actually on the product roadmap. Mm. Because there are always things that come up and if you have to put them through the process, especially when you have people who are as creative as Jimmy Ivey and Trent Reznor, if they come up with an idea, I want to have some resources in my back pocket where we can say, well, let's go prototype that. Let's spend two weeks on that and see what happens. And there are some things that they don't ever make it to the top of the stack, but they are important to consumers and you want to be able to, to pick those off and every now and then have some, have some sizzle. Yeah. Um, so we try to keep, you know, A, we have a really rigorous product process. We've got a long roadmap um, and we have, you know, all of those various teams that we're trying to keep in order. So that's, that's a management problem unto itself. Mm -hmm. But we also try to, you know, reserve some firepower um, for things that are, you know, more, you know, whether it's a small feature or a brand new piece of technology, you know, that, that is going to hit the shelves in, you know, yeah. in four weeks and, oh my God, what can we do or whatever it is, you know, there's always something coming in from left field you want to be prepared for. Awesome. Yeah. How do you want me to answer? Any thoughts here? Just, gener just generally kind of from this, the young startup vantage point? Yeah, I mean, you guys are tiny, small. Yeah, so we're, um, we kind of grew like a weed, right? So Estimate was five, six, seven people last September. August and grew to 35 people in a month and a half, um, and things were just things were just breaking everywhere. People wanted these dev kits. Um, there was press. There was this. Um, we had three or four different products. We had hardware, the client stuff, a mobile team building apps, and we had this like cloud component, which is like obviously what happens with the iBeacon is you get content from the cloud delivered to your device. So. Um, I mean, I th I've learned a lot from this particular sort of startup, I think, in the, like, since I've been here last early fall. And one thing is you just, you, if you inspire yourself with, like, what you're going to do, then you're probably going to inspire others. So you have to have a strong compass initially toward, like, what broader innovations the ecosystem is probably going to want. And you have to basically try to do them before. And then you have to walk around with them, right? So in my pocket, in a Ziploc bag, I have a small beacon. <laughs> it's tiny. Um, Jacob, our CEO, who is in the room, I think, somewhere, gave it to me. I'm like, Jacob, give me this smaller beacon so I can show people. So I show people. I showed Brian earlier, and it's tiny, right? So maybe no one wants it or cares. They probably um, will want something a little bit different. But I think if, if you go through that agile development process like as a company to figure out like, what is going to inspire your customer, then you, then, you, then you start to 
you know, pour the acceleration on growing the business. And so like, I think pre-product and post-product market fit are different as like this deep blanks the world talk about, but also once you've hit product market fit, like what is it you're really selling? Like what is your model? What's your business model? And like how do the other products feed back into like what you've built? So like we think about that a lot and I think like we had some growing pains in the company, so like we had to figure out like how to kind of fill those gaps and, um, and, and right in, in terms of like kind of like structuring the company because I think when you go from a few people or like Instagram was what famously 20 people when they sold to you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, you can do a lot with 20 people, but the challenging part is going from 20 to 100 to 300 or to 1,000 like Square has. Um, so we're sort of trying to figure like that out right now. And um, you, you have to like cover from your mistakes quickly too, right? If you make mistakes on hiring things, you just, you just need to like, um, you can't wait to like make a fix on that. And if, you, and if you do something that people don't want or customers don't want, you should just stop doing it and try something else. Awesome. You have the luxury when you're small to sort of do that, I guess. Yeah. We have about a minute or two left. We've got a bunch of developers in this room. Curious, if you could give one piece of advice to developers, what would it be? And it could be about your guys' platforms. Let's go around the horn and make that quick. You want to start with you, Steve? Come back this way? Yeah, so go to estimo.com, buy a developer <laughs> kit. Um, <laughs> GitHub.com slash estimo. Um, no, I'm, so if you want to add context to your apps, then um, I think iBeacon is a really interesting way to do it. And, um, but my advice would be to try to do things that are a little bit ahead of what your peers are doing um, if you're in an early stage startup, because if you do what they're doing, um, it's not as fun. You should do something more fun. Sweet. I, w I would just say, from, for the most part, people should just trust their instincts. I think if I could, if I look back on my career and, and those, those places where I could have done better are places where I wish I would have trusted my instincts more. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll pimp our developer platform too, which yeah. is at developer.beatsmusic.com. Nice. Um, I guess I'll pimp our platform as well. Um, pimp it. So, <laughs> pimp it. So we have a mobile SDK that basically allows you to integrate the pinup button into your mobile app um, if you're a developer, similar to what you guys launched today uh, for the like button. Yeah. So we'd love it if you used it if you, if you want to get you know, distribution through Pinterest. Fantastic. Uh, I think the thing that I've learned the most at Nike is just kind of just relentless focus on uh, value to the athlete, in our case, the consumer. But just, you know, it's, it's, it's tempting to kind of, uh, you know, think about, hey, what's the value to, to us or what's the value to the partner? And those are certainly important. But, but, you know, at Nike, there's just an incredible focus on always looking through the lens of the athlete and thinking about how this improves his or her life uh, every time we talk about anything, even if it's just kind of a, an initial internal meeting. So I think that focus is, is super valuable. I will pimp the platform, which is, you know, we are working on with a group of folks in the Fuel Lab right now, but I think kind of uh, developer.nike.com as we kind of introduce new services and, and open up the platform would be great to, uh, to obviously start to get to know some folks. Awesome. Brian. Yeah, for me, I guess I'll go back to one of the kind of the first things I set up on the, on the, uh, on the panel here, which is uh, don't constrain yourself to problem solving. I think the filter of, of trying to solve problems can actually be really toxic and uh, really focus on, on delivering value, inventing. Imagining, imagining what the world could be, because that's how we're going to all kind of, you know, contribute to the world in really big ways, not, not, not on the margin. Um, and uh, yeah, platform theme here. Uh, Square has a platform as well, so come check it out. I don't have the URL on me right now, but uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jeff. <laughs> awesome. And on that note, I will say thank you to you guys. Incredible panel. Really appreciate your thanks time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks a lot. I think I came up with our our, our group name too. Pimp the platform. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Let's give them a round of applause again. Thank you guys again for taking time. Next up, we have the seven deadly sins of game monetization. So come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.